lot of the other information that Nick will be talking about, including the papers, will also be available on our website, which we'll put a link to. Um, yeah, we will have a bit of a question time after Nick's presentation. We also have um, Alex Kreese from the um, Wildlife Hospital at Bonnerong, uh, vet from there, and also um, Alex is at the University of Tasmania as a vet veterinarian. And we also have a PhD candidate, I think I've got that right, um, Adam Sistern from the Australian National University and the Difficult Bird Research Group, who will also have um, some time to talk about his research later on. I don't think I've miss, missed anything, so I probably will, we should get this cranking. I'm gonna pass over to Nick Mooney. Um, for those who don't know Nick, Nick's been um, studying the impacts of wildlife changes in landscapes and people's attitudes to that for over 40 years. He's well recognised in Tasmania and Australia for his contributions. Um, the founder of the BirdLife Australia Raptor, um, Raptor, what is it, Nick? Raptor Ooh. Group. There you go. It's nice and simple. I thought it might have had a massive acronym. Um, also, uh, advisor to uh, Raptor Refuge. Um, part of the devil program the list is endless and i think for those who have already clicked into this it will have a, a big section on nick's bio if people want to read through that but i think most people are here to listen to what you've got to say today nick and as um i'm a very big supporter of your research and causes and um so are many of our groups so i look forward to hearing from you as do other people. So we'll kick away. Over to you, Nick. Okay, thanks, Peter. Yes, it's often these sorts of groups where people have to go to a bit of an effort to join. Um, it's not a risk, but you, you can be talking to the converted. Now, I assume some people listening will know quite a lot about uh, the, these chemicals. Other people know very little. And Tasmania is a bit prone to misconceptions, like uh, many people will confuse our, uh, the controversial attitude with 1080 with rod rodenticides and things like that. So I'll try and weave through that. Now, it's got to make sense, it's got to be useful to you. So asking questions uh, in, in the, by the means you have there, uh, sending them in is, is handy because I don't want to talk around an issue people really want to know about. Now. What we're talking about today are rodenticides. Rodenticides are a pesticide, it's a chemical made or um, concentrated by people that, to kill rodents, rats and mice. Now, of course, there's a lot, lot of other animals out there and not all rats and mice are introduced, but when people think rats and mice, they think black rats, brown rats and uh, house mice. But these poisons can kill almost anything simply because they're not species specific. So that immediately says we've got to be careful with them. And we got, part of that care is knowing a lot about them. And I'm afraid we, we know a lot about the chemical and its actions, but we don't know a lot about the impacts on wildlife. And it's not just birds. We happen to be talking, my, you know, my narrow view here is about birds of prey. Now, so we're, we're talking most specifically about anticoagulant rodenticides. Now they're a, a, a poison that's invented by people. It's synthetic, it's made, it's not a natural poison. And what it does is attack the body's ability to produce vitamin K and vitamin K is essential for blood clotting. Now, as I'm standing here, there's lots of micro bleeds in your body. Um, everyone who's listening is having tiny micro bleeds. And your body copes with that on um, second to second, minute to minute, no problem. But with anticoagulants at a certain level in your body, uh, that clotting won't occur and you'll gradually or rapidly bleed to death, depending how much anticoagulant um, you've ingested is in you. And this stuff takes a long time to 
um, metabolize to get rid of. And of course, the whole idea is to kill something before it can metabolize and, and get rid of it. That's quite different to 1080 poison, which is an, an, a plant defense in uh, the gastrolobia in Australia. And because it's a natural thing, a lot of Australian animals have a natural defense. They've evolved with it and they can metabolize it and get rid of it. Most Australian animals have a great resistance to 1080. That's why it's so effective on non-Australian animals like dogs, cats, rabbits. Most Australian animals, particularly the carnivores, are highly resistant to 1080 poisoning. We're talking about anticoagulant rodenticides. Now, the main group of anticoagulants uh, used to be what we call first generation anticoagulants. Wolfrin is an example of that, um, the old early, early models of rat sack, if you like. Um, I'm not that keen on quoting particular products because they do change. But I'll, So I'm just gonna talk about the principles. It's very easy to Google lots of information on this, but I'll try and guide you with the principles to think about. The first generation anticoagulants, animals, rats, mice, anything, had to eat a number of doses before they would get properly poisoned. Now, what people got impatient with that. We're a very impatient lot today, especially today, and people wanted something simpler. So industry responded to that demand and invented a thing called second generation. These are upgraded anticoagulant rodenticides, and these are single dose only, and they are shockingly powerful. And the whole idea is that something has to nibble it, and, and it'll die. Um, they can take some time to die, the same with the first generation anticoagulants. And during that time, the animals can be staring around, looking drunk, they're disoriented, they can be out in the day. They are the most amazingly attractive thing to predators because they're doing everything um, a prey animal shouldn't do. Staggering around, being oblivious of their environment and not being wary at all. So they get gobbled up. When they die, because they've taken a long time to ingest the bait, uh, let's say hours nibbling away, they often have more bait than they need inside them. And so that then brings us to a problem of when that animal is eaten, especially if it is a little thing like a mouse and an owl swallows it whole, it gets not only the dose that killed the animal, but a whole lot more in the gut of the mouse. That's why this poison uh, is so problematic. It's completely different to some poison that might knock an animal dead straight away. Uh, that, unfortunately, those types of poison, poisons are usually very dangerous for people as well, so they tend not to be used. Now, a few things have happened at the same time that people invented these second generation anticoagulants. And one of those things was that we seem to be in a hurry, we seem to be becoming a bit anal. And uh, rather risk intolerant. And that is a lot of people simply won't put up with a hint of rats or mice anywhere. So we start to see these ubiquitous little black boxes, these little poison boxes all over the place. I just had a drive around yesterday and in a, around warehouses in, in on the side of the street all through Moona and Glenorchy, there's these little black boxes. And um, they'll, there'll be poison in those sometimes. And they're in situations, there's no food, there's no reason to be terribly worried about or at all worried about rats and mice. So you've got all this poison going out in the environment at, at uh, say in winter when uh, rats and mice are looking for some more shelter and more food that probably doesn't have to be there. And it's really only because people have become very intolerant of anything um, icky or dirty or um, a rat and mice. And that intolerance combined with the second generation um, anticoagulants is a very deadly combination. Now, I'm talking mainly here about urban areas, but you have houses out in rural areas. So if you've got a house out in a rural area in the bush even, and people are using these poisons, it can impact a huge area because a hawk or an owl might live two or three or four or five kilometers away, um, might even be more. And if they pass there and eat one of these or two of these rats or mice, they can be poisoned. So you can actually impact quite a large catchment, we'd call it. And so yeah, these houses um, or businesses, um, 
I noticed even uh, some of the tourism businesses in the Wilderness World Heritage Area use this poison out in the middle of uh, Tasmania's Western Wilderness. It's crazy. And that often is simply because people don't secure their food well enough and don't build well enough to, to reduce the refuge, the places rats and mice can hide. And of course, in those wild areas, they'll be killing an awful lot of native animals, not just um, black rats, brown rats and house mice. So we have this problem with people's houses and businesses way out in the bush or in uh, farmland becoming giant bait stations and they can have a very large impact. And of course, um, these properties might only be hundreds of metres uh, apart and or even a kilometre apart. And so this bait station system marches through the landscape. You can have a poultry farm and those are usually surrounded by poison bait stations. They can be in very remote areas simply to get away from people complaining about the smell or the noise. And being in remote areas, um, there can be all sorts of hawks, eagles, owls, quolls, devils, all having access to these dead and dying rats and mice. Because they can take a few hours to die, and most of people listening to this will have seen rats and mice stogging around and finding them dead in some very strange places, of course they can disperse. And so um, they can be outside a place they would normally be hiding in the day. So scavengers, um, a lot of raptors scavenge, but also ravens, butcher birds, magpies, currawongs, gulls, it just goes on and on, uh, can eat these things. And this poison, just keep remembering, is not species specific. It can affect all animals, people too. But um, that's uh, not what we're talking about. The um, so the in other countries, people are, have better guidelines um, for the, the use of these chemicals. And in fact, uh, the British Barn Owl Trust, it's called, has some excellent guidelines and fact sheets, much better than stuff that's available in Australia. In Australia, it's a bit chaotic. Every ag department has different material, different states sell different chemicals. Uh, most places in Europe, you simply can't go down the supermarket like you can in Australia, Tasmania included, and buy a great big pile of second generation anticoagulants, uh, very, very powerful poisons. Um, if you read the, the packaging and the instructions, there's this, this tiny minuscule print, uh, maybe half a line on uh, dispose of dead animals uh, where other animals, pets and wildlife can't eat them. But it's, no one ever reads that stuff. It's so tiny, you'd have to say it's hidden to, um, to give the impression these things are pretty safe. And these, one, uh, one baiting f kills all, um, style that's terribly convenient for some people is is the biggest problem now I'm, I'm going to try and share the screen here and i'll talk about the sorts of birds and how you can consider doing risk assessments for what sort of birds i won't go through all the animals um, do this so here we go share screen oh there we are can is that up and can people see that we can, Nick. Thank you. Oh, good. So how I would go about looking at the relative risk for birds of prey, raptors, and these are just uh, acronyms and the, the names. You've got the species down the left-hand side. Now, I would consider their metabolism. Big birds like eagles have a lower metabolism than small birds. That means they have to eat relatively less, but because they're really big, they'll still eat more in total. The amount of your metabolism and meaning how much you're going to eat will have a lot to do with how much food and poison you might ingest in a certain period. Small birds like uh, collared sparrowhawks have to eat a couple of times a day, whereas an eagle might only eat every few days. Makes a big difference. You can consider whether they eat whole animals or just eat part of a big animal. Um, a lot of um, owls swallow animals whole if they can. And that means they are extremely high risk from that point of view of swallowing the poison rodent plus the poison that's not yet digested in its stomach. Whereas uh, um, birds like eagles, which often kill things much bigger than they can swallow in one go, often eating 
um, a kilo of meat off the, the animal or something like that. And that will have some poison in it, but nothing like the gut content has. So we can rank these species for metabolism. We can rank them for their eating habits, if you like, whether they eat whole things or not. And I would just rank the ones that eat whole things like the owls um, at a higher risk. Um, Wedge-tailed eagles often scavenge and they're an interesting case for an eagle because they behave a lot like a vulture for some parts of their life um, and so do sea eagles. They scavenge a lot. So if there's a, a poisoning operation where there's a lot of rats and mice killed, particularly in farmland, even if it's first generation anticoagulants, uh, they might wander around eating lots of, lots of rats because they could eat 20 or 30 rats. Um, they're a big bird. So we can actually look at what their diet would be. And with carrion, the diet can be pretty well anything, but collared sparrowhawks don't eat dead wallabies. But they eat lots of insects, small birds, small mammals. Wedge-tailed eagles might eat almost anything. And so they can eat um, animals that have been poisoned. But there's all, and this is where an Australian character is introduced here in that we have a lot of reptiles reptiles are very tolerant to rodenticides, these anticoagulants. And what that means is they can eat a lot of this stuff. Um, and reptiles will eat dead mice, things like that. Even the blue tongue skinks will eat dead mice. So they can ingest a lot of this chemical, this poison, hold it in their bodies, not die, but be a, if they get eaten, they can hand on super doses. So anything that eats reptiles might be at special risk in Australia, whereas in uh, other parts, particularly colder parts of Europe and America, there's not so many reptiles out there doing that. So Australia has a, a particular risk with its, its reptiles. The home range is important. Something with a large home range can obviously visit several poison stations, places poisons used. They're not, you know, they're not deliberately set as poison stations for anything except rats and mice. Doesn't matter, they are. So an eagle that covers uh, lots of home range, I'd give that a, a very high ranking because in its home range, most eagles would probably encounter poison rats and mice. Whereas a collared sparrowhawk or a little boobook might be, have a very small home range and happen to not encounter these things. So you can add those ranks up and give yourself a risk rating. And what comes out very high are wedge-tailed eagles, masked owls and brown falcons. Brown falcons, um, interesting, um, they're very widespread. They eat almost anything, love rats and mice. So they are almost certainly going to encounter rats and mice in the rural landscape and around urban areas. A lot of these birds will hunt in backyards, farm backyards and things like that. So I'll see if I can uh, move on. So, what happens with these birds, uh, sorry, these rats and mice? Uh, this is a photo I took on the docks of Burnie. These, there were poison mice all over the place, just sitting in roads, sitting in paddocks, looking very miserable. And, uh, they are, and they're alive, most of these, when I saw them. And uh, the gulls were eating them. And there were butcher birds catching them and all this stuff. So this little exercise, there's no food there. I can't imagine why they were poisoning it. Um, unless people just didn't want to have rats and mice about and poison's cheap, so it's easy to throw lots of poison around. And almost certainly there would have been birds of prey and other native birds uh, killed by this sort of exercise. This is in Richmond. Here's some, um, I knew a neighbour of mine was uh, down the road was poisoning. Here's a, a dead rat that's been eaten, almost certainly eaten by a goshawk. There's a goshawk lives around there, or it used to. <laughs> and... Um, this sort of stuff in the urban environment, the rural, in, the industrial environment um, is, is prolific. And here's a good example of a dead mouse that's actually been eaten by wasps, European wasps. But you can see the blue stain in the middle. That's all the poison in the gut, that um, excess poison, that it wasn't needed to kill the mouse. But because it takes a few hours to die and the mouse can still eat for a while, it's gonna fill its gut up. And so that, whole mouse is um, very, very toxic. So this is the impact. So a sick masked owl here, after eating a few of these rats and mice, they're often drooling and the drool often has blood in it because it's an anticoagulant. 
That's the name of the chemical and that's what it does. And they look sick and they are disoriented and uh, look half asleep. And uh, out in the day like that, if you're an owl, it's a very bad sign. So, and this is what happens with that, this group of our, um, birds, the owls, they often swallow things whole. Here's a, an owl pellet with a whole sugar glider head in it, for instance. They can swallow quite large things. And so that makes them especially vulnerable to swallowing poison rodents. Um, there was a very interesting study, quite alarming really, by a, a key person in this field, Michael Lower, uh, on boo books, um, very much the same as our little boo books here in West Australia. And he found sampling boo books that nearly three quarters carried anticoagulant residues in them. 18% nearly, nearly a fifth of the boo books he sampled had enough to kill them. That's pretty alarming. And we have boo books here, but thorny frogmouse. There's a bird that swallows things whole. And if that happened to be around where there's lots of mice, um, they'd be at very high risk, as would kookaburras, as would ravens. Um, ravens can eat four or five or six mice without any trouble and take them back, regurgitate them for their chicks or just die anyway. So, uh, and then, as I said, you can add in butcher birds and everything else. Um, James Pay at University of Tasmania, uh, who can't, couldn't be with us today, he's been testing um, several hundred wedge-tailed eagles that we'd kept over many years uh, in case someone wanted them like this. And his results, uh, which I can't discuss because they're not published, but I can say that they were very similar to the boobles. And uh, some of the residues of these anticoagulants and eagles in Tasmania were uh, extremely high and that little old Tasmania, clean green Tasmania. Now there's a particular problem with one chemical and it's, it's, it's trade name is Pindone. It's an anticoagulant, it's a rodenticide that's been rebadged for rabbits. It's used for rabbits in areas near people because people don't like 1080 and 1080 is dynamite on dogs. But Potentially, there's an anti antidote with pindone or any of these anticoagulants. You just have to inject super high amounts of vitamin K until the animal recovers. Now, this there was a little pindone poisoning operation near Richmond, and we found four dead and dying eagles within a few kilometres of that operation, and they were found without searching. People just found them. Normally, that area through that period of time, uh, we would need about five or six times that area to find one eagle. So this, the odds of this happening and not being due to pindone are very rare. So one pindone operation in a backyard essentially can affect um, literally um, 50, 100 square kilometers, no problem, because these eagles are moving a long way. And um, here we are trying to you know, save eagles with all sorts of efforts in forestry and rehabilitation and um, TAS networks, uh, trying to fix problems with power lines when these sorts of incidents occur. And it's really just because rabbits are, um, the person got was annoyed with rabbits. Um, you have to have a license to use Pindone, but anyone can go and buy it. And the common brown falcon, here's a very sick looking brown falcon near a poison, that same poison operation. And I, I would think this bird may have scavenged on a poisoned rabbit with pindone, an anticoagulant. So what I encourage people to do is have a think about the, the poison they want. Even you're in the shop, look at it, take a photograph, Google the active ingredient. The active ingredient is the chemical inside the product that will do the damage. See what it is. Uh, see what advice you can find. Be a bit discriminating about it. So, and uh, other birds that eat lots of rats and mice, uh, swamp harriers, a migratory species. There's a very sick looking one on the right there. And here's a camera of mine on a nest and you can see blue tongue skinks being, this being fed to the chicks and a blue tongue is got the potential to carry uh, enormous amounts of rodenticides if it happens to eat the pellets. And small, um, small blue tongues, of course, can access place lots of rats and mice can to get pellets. These are poison pellets, um, but they equally can eat dead uh, mice and pick up the poison that way. So 
uh, the most unlikely customers. Um, goshawks often hunting around farmyards and rural, urban and uh, rural areas. And this one's got a large rat. Um, I wouldn't have a clue if it was a poison rat, hopefully not. But when they're eating rats, they often discard the stomach. So they're not actually at the extreme risk of say, that an owl is because they're not eating the whole thing. They're discarding the stomach with any poison contents. And uh, who would think um, a peregrine falcon might get impacted by uh, rodenticides, but this, uh, peregrines hunt up around the Burney Wharf where I saw the gulls eating the poison mice. And if there was a gull feeling sick and flopping around, nothing would be more attractive to a peregrine. So the poison can infiltrate through lots of mechanisms and means, and it doesn't break down very quickly. It dil dilutes, but that's not breaking down. 1080 is uh, a, a natural plant ingredient and it's biodegradable, um, particularly bacteria and fungi. So it will go away. Whereas these rodenticides don't, they just dilute, add up, and sometimes store themselves in animals or places. And uh, they can suddenly um, appear somewhere else with um, some sheet erosion or things like that. They can be moved about. So, so, in dealing with these chemicals, we've got to think, here's a typical rural, rural landscape in Tasmania, um, up in the hills there, uh, houses down the bottom, but all these raptors are nesting right through all these areas. They haven't got much choice. There's not, not always a lot of space, but often these places are rich in food. They've got hazards, they've got power lines, all sorts of things, but they half these houses, and I mean pretty well half these houses will be using convenient rodenticides such as second generation anticoagulants. There are some really interesting alternatives and in that a lot of them are mechanical. There's some very clever multiple kill uh, traps now, um, things that have a gas piston that um, whack the animal. And uh, they're not just old fashioned rat traps and mouse traps such as we're all familiar with. There's some very, very clever uh, mechanical traps now that are both humane and will kill a lot of rats and mice. And uh, we don't have to use these poisons, certainly nothing like the uh, volumes and the casual way we, that we do. Now, I think I've used up my time, haven't I, Peter? Kate? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Yeah, you're, you're right on time, mate. So um, I guess I've got a couple of uh, questions from uh, the previous, like from people who put questions in beforehand. Indeed. Um, and I think you've answered most of those. I think the one that I had a couple of was um, what animal, what um, is the difference in terms of um, birds in Tasmania that are really getting hammered by um, the second generation. So um, can you just kind of spell that out? I know you've given a, a yeah, brief, we, um... but... Um, I talk mainly about the potential because we actually we actually don't know what we know of instances of different species being killed and uh, uh, we know of a number of uh, white goshawks, grey goshawks that have been killed by rodenticides, also masked owl, but they're big obvious birds that people tend to yeah. all notice it. Whereas lots of small birds like butcher birds or little boobooks or collared sparrowhawks, people don't notice, they're not as obvious. So our knowledge is biased a bit towards the birds that are easily found and seen and recognised. What's needed are population studies where you test lots of animals out there at random, a bit like coronavirus, and you find out what's really going on out there. You look at the reproductive rates, um, the survivability of particular individual, um, individuals carrying particular levels of chemicals. You have to do a very target approach. What we know is uh, just from the, uh, the bits of testing being done on eagles, and that's pretty well, eagles and a few masked owls are pretty well the only thing that's been tested here, is that um, we should be having quite serious impacts because those levels are the same, if not higher, than many places in Europe and North America that where they've studied the impacts. So we sh every indication is we should have a serious problem here. Um, I think the casual use of pindone, for instance, um, is is a, a very bad problem and it's probably killing a lot of eagles. You don't actually have to kill one of these birds to 
um, with the poison to kill it because all you've got to do is make it sick and it will starve to death. Mm. All you've got to do is make it sick and it's more not paying attention. It'll hit a power line or hit a wind turbine or get run over by a car. Um, being sick is a very hazardous thing. <laughs> and uh, we, yeah. we all know that. And so even uh, low levels that aren't lethal to the bird can kill the bird indirectly. And we think that may be happening a lot with collisions, uh, not just in Tasmania. That seems to be an international problem. So another question we've got about, um, do you support the, um, the banning of counter sale SGARs, like, you know, hardware and grocery stores, yes. or do you, what's actually, your thought on regulation? I, I actually support the, the banning to the general public of second generation anticoagulants. Um, first generation should be restricted. People should have to sign for this stuff. Um, it's got to be wound back somehow. Um, um, the, the European countries that give advice on this, their first advice is to reduce the attractiveness of your place to rodents. You, have, um, you, you, make, you seal it up better and you protect the food better. I've seen mm. poison used where there's grain and, and food laying around all over the place. And so people have, have just been incredibly lazy to, and throw a bit of bait around. Uh, that's not always the yeah. case, but it does happen like that where there is a bad Australian habit to one of the first things to do is you go for the chemicals. It is, yeah. it is Australia's a bit famous for it and Tasmania is very famous for it. Mm. Okay. And um, I mean, that, we were going to hear, hopefully you have, um, you know, a farmer on today who's changed their practices through, like, it's a member actually who changed their practices through just becoming aware of the impacts of SGARs. I mean, that would be the industry to me that would be, um, you know, necessary to have these, the food industry. There's, you said there's some alternatives, like are they looking at alternatives? I, you've mentioned Michael uh, Lower, who we totally respect for his um, input into our program. Uh, is there any research going on about um, other products? A lot of the research has been focused heavily on the urban areas where we can cut back our poison use a lot. I mean, if you, mm. it, I, ha I used to have, chooks and I had a horrible rat and mouse problem in my house. I got rid of the chooks, mm. the problem instantly stopped. People, if you're gonna run a big messy compost heap and you whinge about rats and mice, that's not a reasonable um, package, you know, it's irrational. You can't have it sure. both ways. And the, one of the, one of the, the key non-anticoagulant pesticides being investigated is, is one that, um, is based on vitamin uh, D3, and that has a completely different mode of action. It doesn't, mm. uh, it's not an anticoagulant, and it it affects uh, mineralization of the kidney, so the animal dies of uh, renal failure. So that is not as severe for birds as anticoagulants. Birds have hollow bones, and the mechanism is such that it doesn't really impact them as much, but it's not freely available. It's not the habit people have to use it. So those sort of new chemicals coming in, um, we have to try and support them, but they should be supported with research, not, not just because yeah. they're a new chemical. We've um, got to do a lot more homework to find out which ones are the best. The rural situation where you have broad scale use of pesticides sometimes uh, in quite, quite large areas, you know, um, many hectares at a time. Uh, mostly that's first generation uh, anticoagulants if someone's using anticoagulants. And so they're not as harmful. I'm actually more concerned about the second generations where they're used in little villages and houses and uh, which is, represent bait stations scattered through the landscape. Um, yeah. They're a bit more expensive. So in a rural setting, they usually, uh, people are less inclined to use the second generations. And um, just a follow on question about, um, is there any, are there any regulations about um, disposal of carcasses? Like, no, there's, is there anything? No, no there's none. Um, and I know people that um, 
they find dead rats after they've poisoned and they're not going to touch them because they're poisoned and they're terrified of the poison. Well, I'm not sure there's a responsible loop operating there. Um, right. uh, the best thing to do is burn them. Um, don't throw them in water because that poison will stay in the water. Um, you bury them, something yeah. can dig them up. Um, I suggest you burn them. There aren't regulations about it. There is by, there's advice on all the packaging, um, responsibly to dispose, but I would suggest the responsible thing to do is to burn them. And um, without peppering you with questions, it's coming through pretty thick, Nick. But um, uh, so what about the um, other higher order predators? I know this is about raptors, your talk, but um, devils and quolls, what's the, is there a impact on those types of things? There can be. There have been devils killed in captivity by, um, th after rat poisoning around those captive enclosures. Um, I think um, Alex could probably answer a few bit more of that too, do you reckon? Yes, it, it probably could, certainly with captivity, but I know there have been devils, captive devils killed by uh, rat poisoning operations that, where they've eaten poison rats. And a, a, a rat staggering around in the devil enclosure, you've got a bored devil, it, it wouldn't be able to believe its luck, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, quolls can certainly be killed. Um, there will be slight differences between species with susceptibility, but a lot of that will be metabolism. Um, generally speaking, um, all, all animals are susceptible to these um, anticoagulants. Um, Alex, did you want to add anything to that, um, Alex? Uh, yeah, no. So um, we just um, we we had uh, someone doing. We were collecting samples, liver samples from um, dead raptors and carnivores, and. Um, and they were testing uh, the rodenticide poisoning on in, in the liver of these animals. And uh, one that I remember that was had the highest um, levels was an eastern quoll that was not a captive one, uh -huh. was uh, from from the wild that came really unwell and it died. Um, but uh, when uh, and I, I, I can't comment on the on the on the results because it hasn't been published yet. But um, I remember asking the researcher um what he thought about that and he said oh this cannot be uh secondary poisoning it's just too high it must be must have eaten the, the poison itself so we do see even like just not just a secondary poisoning in in the carnivores but just as a as a primary poisoning as well um and while i've got you alex um is there Anything else that you would like to add to Nick's um, Nick's talk, or would you like to? Um, th there are a couple of questions that are already coming through for you. Um, yeah, so uh, just um, in our experience here, we don't we don't see many birds that come that we. So, so first, it, it, in birds, it's really hard to to test before they die. Uh, if they have been poisoned by rodenticide. So uh, we go more for the clinical signs and some other blood parameters that we can test. So because it causes bleeding uh, and not always the bleeding is obvious. So it can be bleeding in the, um, in the, in the internal bleeding that I, I, I can't see in the physical exam. Uh, but then that will cause anemia. So hardly ever we see raptors that uh, uh, I suspect that have been poisoned, but it's like Nick said, um, it's the, the, the impact that can cause, I think um, the research has shown that a lot of these raptors have had contact with um, rodenticide, um, rodenticides and, and they can just become sick and then die of something else or be hit by a car or, yeah. or hit a power line or so, something. Um, one of the questions we had too was, um, is it a like is uh, the being poisoned is it a painful for the animals? Like, is it a painful? So um, yeah, so the, the, that's a good question, and I I, I don't know, um, I, I can't be certain of the uh, of 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 the answer. So it's not something that we look for in in the clinical signs uh, if the animal is in pain or not so uh, it's much 
easier to assess pain in domestic animals because they will show much more than, than wildlife. Um, but the clinical signs will depend on where the bleeding occurs. So for instance, in dogs, uh, it's common to have uh, bleeding in the thorax. So they will be um, short of breath and sort of not be able to, to, to breathe. And if the bleeding is in the joints, they will be lame on whatever um, limb that, that, that's happening. So I, I, I don't think it is painful itself. It's more like it will cause that lethargy and they'll be really quiet and then they will be um, an easy prey or, or they will die much. Even if, if the poison is not sufficient to kill, but they will be so lethargic for a while that, that they might die of something else. Okay. And um, just in terms of uh, residue, um, like does this, I think Nick kind of touched on this and Nick, you're still there so you could pipe in, but is, it, is there a, does it break down over time or does it just continue to build up in the body of the animal over like a... Um, a yeah, I, I, I don't know. Nick might, the... might, might know, know better how to, to answer this question. I'm not sure about that. Uh, the, 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 how it operates, it looks like it just keeps building up, although the animal can repair the, over a long period, if it's had a minor dose, it can gradually repair the vitamin K production. So it, okay. with a very minor dose, given enough time, and not dying of something else, the animal uh, can heal. That's um, what I've read. But the, the residues uh, diminish uh, it, they, they more dilute. So an animal over a period of time gets rid of a lot of fluids, um, eats and has droppings and all the rest, and it will gradually get rid of uh, some of the, uh, the, the, um, the critical chemicals. Uh, but they don't change so much. They just simply get dispersed in the environment. So we're gradually <laughs> filling up the environment with these horrible things. Um, is, that, what, is there a big difference? Is there a big difference between the, um, is it bioaccumulant, is that the right word or? Um, it, in the short term, yes, but the animal can, can get rid of some of the elements of it. Um, most animals- so is, that a big it, is there a difference does, between this first and second generation? Uh, uh, yes, the, um, you can identify the different types from, um, and the, the main difference is really how, many, how much will kill an animal. So the second generation ones, they need much less. Um, that, that is really the main, the main functional difference. The fact that we can test these animals um, years after they've probably ingested this stuff and find residues tells you it stays around a long time. And some of these animals have been dead for a long time and we still find it. It's not um, biodegrading in, in carcasses necessarily. It's a very persistent chemical and that's one of the problems with using it in very precious places like islands is it doesn't um, biodegrade like 1080 does. It's far more, uh, uh, it's much more of an acute poison than 1080. Okay, thanks. Um, look, I've got a couple of other questions, but I think we've still got a, um, Alex, did you want to add anything else? Otherwise I'll hand over to Adam and hear about some of his research. Are you okay with that, Alex? Yeah, yep, that's fine. So um, thank you very much, Nick. That was fantastic. And um, if anybody's got any further questions, just to put them in the chat. And Nick, you'll, st you'll hang on until the end of the talk. So oh, um, sure, if we've yeah. got any more. Um, I'm happy to deal with an email at a later date if it comes to that, no problem. Okay, fantastic. So, um, but uh, just handing over to um, Adam, and thanks Alex too for your comments there. Appreciate it. Um, Adam um, is currently a PhD student at uh, Canada at the Australian National University, um, also a member of the Difficult Bird Research Group. Um, we, from Landcare Tasmania perspective, we've had a, a bit of a relationship with Adam for a while and been able to secure a little bit of funding to support some of his research. 
Um, I think I've mentioned that with the support of BirdLife Australia's Twitchathon Tasmania um, event and also from Keep Tassie Wild, um, just as part of our um, community rodenticide awareness program that we've been running. Um, and Adam, your research it sounds fantastic and exciting. And instead of me explaining it, I thought I might hand over to you and you can give us a bit of a, an update and also um, how some of the rodenticide stuff is overlapping with your research. So over to you, Adam. Cool. Hi. Um, well, I guess I'm one of three people who have been actively researching rodenticide exposure in Australia in the past five years or so. Uh, and I'm investigating it in uh, the Tasmanian mast owl, which as Nick, Nick has pointed out, is one of those which really has a high risk rating of being affected by these chemicals. And um, I have basically a very simple question in this part of my research, and that is, well, what is the uh, exposure in the Tasmanian mast owls to anticoagulant rodenticides, which I'm just going to refer to as ARs now because it's too hard to say. Um, and I've decided to look at this, uh, to assess it in uh, two different samples. And um, I think they can tell us two very different things, but I still address that one question. And the first sample is uh, looking at livers. So I, I noticed that some of the questions are, how long do these uh, chemicals stick around in animals uh, of uh, various species that uh, are being exposed to them? And the answer is it's actually really quite a long time. This is because it, is, it does actually accumulate in the liver and it has a, a very, very strong binding in the liver. And the half-life of these chemicals in the liver is really quite long. It's, it's in, in, in some owl species, uh, the half-life is out to close to a year from uh, consumption. Um, so the first sample that I'm looking at are all of the deceased uh, mast owls that were in storage, in freezers, much like they did with the wedge tail eagles. And then just as they turn up uh, throughout the year as well. So I, tend, I think I'm tending to get about 10 each year. That is, some that come from Alex and others which are just uh, specimens found by the side of the road or in people's backyards or whatnot. And <clears throat> we look at the livers and we look at uh, a panel of uh, these chemicals in the liver, livers, how much is there per kilogram, okay? And through doing this, we essentially, uh, we can estimate, uh, well, what is the uh, amount of uh, uh, these chemicals uh, in our sample, okay? And hopefully then extrapolate that out to the population, although that's really quite difficult because we need to understand our samples spatially and demographically, which quite often I don't have uh, that kind of information to do with. But in terms of like uh, linking to Alex and the veterinarians as well, we can, and, and you can go to Mike Law's paper, papers, the three papers he's done, which I think are gonna be provided for you as uh, references and see that actually there has been a bit done on uh, the passage and the toxicity of these chemicals in birds of prey in laboratory settings through feeding uh, laboratory uh, animals, birds in this case, sometimes owls, um, uh, rodents that have been fed these chemicals. And so we have some idea of uh, uh, toxicosis, okay, including what the, the, the level of these chemicals in the lev, liver tells you uh, about whether or not the animals are suffering some form of toxicosis. And so because we have that for each dead animal, we can actually estimate the toxicity to the population. Yep, or to our sample at least. The second sample that I'm gonna look at is I want to look at, because I'm obviously investigating it in a wild population, is to look at it in the living population. And in order, this is a little bit more difficult to do because it's difficult to go out and just capture a whole bunch of masked owls and try and figure out if they have some form of coagulopathy going on. But 
what we know from the laboratory studies is that about 30% of the residue that's consumed exits barn owls again as part of the pellet that they are they they, they spew out after they've they've eaten and, and done as much digesting as they can. And so the other thing that we would like to do, or I would like to do, is uh, assess the level of AR residue in pellets at a randomly uh, obtained selection of roof sites, masked out roof sites. And then this, and if we can do it as a little bit of a time series, even if we have to collect them together to save money, um, this can give us a estimation of the exposure in the living population of ours. And it just gives us then two different samples to look at, the ultimate goal to estimate exposure in the entire population. And so far, with the funds that I've received, I have a collection of about 37 dead owls. I've managed to analyze uh, 20 livers. Um, I expect by the end of the PhD, I'll probably have had a sample size there of about 50, um, which should be sufficient. And I mean, in terms of results, which I can't just give you all the numbers now, because it's unpublished like everybody else's at the moment, but there was only one owl in the 20 that I've analyzed that did not have anticoagulant residues in their liver. And going by those studies that Michael Law gives you in his papers where he says he gives a level in the liver of milligrams per kilogram, in the highest level, which is the level which is um, likely to be causing uh, real toxicity in the animals, um, I have. Uh, quite a few, I'd say greater than 18%, which is what you saw in wedge tail eagles so far. Um, other than that, we're working on establishing a set of roost sites to collect uh, pellets from, and hopefully within about a year and a half, we'll, we'll have a, a, a data set that's actually meaningful. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Thanks, Adam. Um, got, a few, got a few questions, obviously. Mm. <laughs> um, so, uh, is so it, when you're one of the questions is about um, when you're measuring a specific uh, SGAR. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on the? Um, like, are you getting multiple SGARs? Because a lot of people might not know that there's different bros and flows that are, I don't know any of, how to pronounce any of them, but... Um, sure. Is that so a... The thing about, yeah, absolutely. So the thing about these chemical chemicals, uh, we'll just stick with SGARs for the moment. We also do some FGARs, although I haven't detected FGARs yet in my, in the 20 that I've done. Very small sample size, right? So let's be... Keep it in perspective. But um, the thing with the SGARs is they all have the exact same mode of action. They're all just a der derivative of the same chemical. So we actually collectively put them together and add up the amount of total AR, yeah? yeah. But in terms of whether we see multiples, yes. In, 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 in almost every animal, there are multiple different ARs in. You know? And I'm sure the one that's the most there maybe is just representative of what people are using in them area that the owl is uh what's foraging. Oh, like like nick says they have large home ranges so they're foraging in a bunch of different places yeah right but yeah um, you see multiple different ones uh in terms of uh, this has come across a couple of questions about um carcasses um and not just today but in the past so um people uh where's the if they do find a Raptor carcass, where is the best place to take it so that it can support yours and other research in the future? Probably the best thing to do is, I, first of all, I log them all with uh, the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, because all the specimens I collect go through, go through them and then to me. Um, so you can contact them, their TMAG, or myself, and Landcare can provide my email, or Nick, yes. or Bonarong, have been providing me with ours as well. Yeah, so myself, uh, Nick Mooney, um, TMAG and Bonarong. Okay, we can put that information on the website. Thank I hope you don't mind, Nick. 
No, no, no. I, um, and we're, we're all, doing we've it all anyway, got, so I figured it was okay. No, we've all got permits to hold this stuff, so that's like okay. that's good. Yeah, I guess it's just um, the kind of uh, the angle people are kind of trying to contribute to research, but sometimes um, I've had this before where uh, bird carcasses are just disposed of because they don't know where to take them or they give them to the wrong place. So, if in doubt, you bag it, you tag it where it came from, when, and you freeze it. Yeah, um, okay. that, there's, that's not that hard. And then, then you've got time to get on to um, deposit it you know, through us. It's my next bumper sticker. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. Um, and <laughs> Tag it, tag it. <laughs> and freeze it. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, just it's uh, just a question about who the other researchers were, but uh, could you, it's Michael Lower, Michael and James. Yeah, and Michael and James, uh, James Pay as well in Tasmania. Michael is over in University of WA. Yes, James is at um, University of Tasmania. That's correct. Um, uh, Michael's papers are on the website um, on the. Lancaster has website along with Nick's work. Um, I think we're almost there. Is let me just have a look at my. Um, so with um, mitigating, it's a ten eighty question, Nick. Um, uh, poison laid. Um, how do we stop? nesting wedgies and stuff from eating any of the 1080 or is it uh, I, the I, um, there there has been no records in tasmania of a bird of prey ever being killed by 1080 uh, full stop okay. um the birds we know about um that that have been tested in decades ago when 1080 was being developed have uh, amongst the highest resistance to 1080 of any vertebrates, very high, not, not reptiles, any birds, any mammals, reptiles are super high. So uh, those, what it tells you is those birds simply can't eat enough poison wallaby or whatever the, the carcass is to do themselves any recognizable harm. Um, so okay. where birds of prey are killed, and uh, killed very acutely. That is, they, they drop dead shortly after eating it. It's where people are using illegal chemicals. And that huh. has been a nasty habit in Tasmania where someone couldn't be bothered with tenority, so they go through the shed and find, oh, this looks good. And of course, we had that recent case in Victoria where a, far, a farmer uh, killed over um, hundreds of eagles on uh, several properties. Yeah. And that's misuse of chemicals that are meant for other things and some of them are extremely toxic. So often 1080 gets the blame for that sort of idiocy. Um, I'm not saying 1080, you... farmers, I'm saying it's yeah. not high up as a risk for those birds in that situation. If your dog chews a bit of uh, 1080 wallaby, it could be in serious trouble because dogs happen to be about the most sensitive vertebrate there is ah. to 1080. So the difference between say a dog and a devil a devil pound for pound is about 30 times as resistant as a dog. And an eagle is twice as resistant as that. Great, and okay, well, thank you for that clarification. Sounds like good regulations are the key there. Um, and uh, yeah, Adam, do you want more carcasses? Yes. Okay, so- I want, um, for, I want them for my project in general as well. Sure. Um, and it's very important that any decent carcass laying in a backyard or on the side of the road, uh, it's just going to rot. It's, it's a terrible waste. Um, those animals have died prematurely anyway, so I think it is much better they go to a use such as, and typically Adam or James students, or they, they, the museum can hold them till another student comes along. So uh, let's collect them. There are a scattering of people, as, as Adam Myself, other people that have permits that let us hold this stuff legally. But um, even if someone hears about it, knows it's on the side of the road somewhere and lets us know, and then we can arrange to get it if people don't want to handle these things. And that's fair enough. But we've got to get them for, and Adam um, needs them. You know, it's, it's very important for his work to get that strength on the statistics. 
Um, and I've just got a, just on a note on that, um, we will be running a couple of um, community awareness programs down south when we're allowed to have information sessions again. Um, so they'll be targeted in some of the southern areas. So I'll be staying in touch with Nick and Adam and others, including Alex, to um, make sure that, that we, we can kind of put that into the, the mix of people who become more aware of what, about what to do with carcasses. Um, and finally, the, oh, the, there are a couple of natural um, poisons, if you will, that are being um, promoted. One through Bunnings, um, Ratsack Naturals is one. Um, what about um, Racumen? Is, are these some of the alternatives that we should be looking at for industrial use or? Well, Rackerman is a first generation anticoagulant. So um, it's it's kind of a, an old poison. It's been around a long time. And uh, a lot, lot of it's used in the rural landscape because it's cheaper, it's effective enough. And uh, fortunately, it's less harmful than the second generation stuff. I don't know the natural rat sack. I don't know what that is. You, I, first thing you do is you look at the essential, the active, sorry, the active ingredient on the bag just Google it on your phone. You soon find out what it is. Yeah. It's usually the smallest font on the whole box, isn't it? It, is. Um, it is. Um, and uh, just uh, last, uh, the other thing was about um, just a couple of questions about submissions for um, a veterinary review at the moment. Uh, Nick, have you got any comments on that about what people might, should do? Well, I suggest people, uh, well, you can, there's some um, standardised sort of rote letters circulating that you can uh, contribute to, or you can read some of these reports, have a think, pick a, pick an area that you find interesting and do some Google, Google you know, um, do, do a little bit of homework and write your own submission. But I, I think given the lack of information, particularly translating um, the odd poisoning and some... Uh, residues we know about into translating that into real impacts on populations um, without that information we we shouldn't be registering using these chemicals it's it's cavalier um, we should be far more precautionary and careful about our use of these chemicals um, and so if that's what this review of registration does and creates a bit of caution winds things back a bit um, that's good uh, uh, and we catch up with research and we might find there's ways of using some of this stuff that's much safer than other ways. And that's the whole idea of doing research and making decisions based on proper information, not just uh, popularity. Yeah. Mm. So um, just for everybody listening, the, uh, there is a review of SGARs and I think first generation as well. Uh, submissions are due, I think, on the middle of uh, July. Um, Bird Life Australia has a um, a web page with a as uh, Nick says a, a pre filled out uh, submission form, um, but all the details are there and on our uh, website as well. Details for how to make a submission um, and where to make that submission to, and let's hope we can um, back it up with a bit of published research before then, so that um, it gives it a bit more legs. Um, just a quick question about um, the bag and tag stuff for your freezer is it uh, you know is it safe to put it in your food freezer is one of the questions yeah, yeah, no, what do you got enough. your freezer um, Nick yeah fair enough if it's um, I, I just I put stuff in a couple of different bags um, and uh, there's often an old freezer out the back people use for whatever else but you just bag it several times it's uh, it's it's once that specimen is contained and frozen it's very safe um, and the regulations for um, collecting no the there are the all, these, all these birds we're talking about are legally protected uh, and but if you collect something and move it on to people who have permits you know within a day uh, it's it's generally regarded as doing it in good faith you know um, if you hang on to it, yeah. that's what will get you into trouble. So it just um, common sense. Email should solve a lot. Uh, email and phones, phone 
uh, mobile phones solve this problem. Uh, as long as people, the right people are notified, you can even let the museum go or let, let the people we know. But um, you can shortcut that by um, acting in good faith, doing it quickly. And that gives Adam the best chances to use it anyway. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I, don't, I think that's about all the questions I've got. Um, I think we might wrap it up if that's okay. Thanks um, to Nick for uh, your presentation and also answering a very, very broad um, amount of questions there. And Adam and Alex too, um, fantastic. Um, and a great audience, really great detailed questions with some um, other answers on the side. I think we need to um, keep this conversation going. Uh, I think uh, we'll be doing, as I said, we'll, Landcare Tasmania will be running a few uh, information sessions in targeted areas down south. Um, probably once we get, once we're allowed to meet with greater than five people, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, uh, I think we all just stay in touch, and I think um, our newsletter will have a few intermittent things about road endicides, and we'll just continue to update our website. So. Um, Thank you very much. And thanks, Kat, for the behind the scenes and organising this today. Much appreciated. And everybody stay safe. Thanks, so, Peter. Thank you. Okay, all the best.